Hello, everyone. Good morning. All right, looks like an eager bunch. I'm glad to see that you're all sitting at tables with other people. I don't think I see anybody at a solo. If you're at a solo table, I'm going to warn you now. I'm going to ask you guys to do some chatting with one another. So you may have to move in a minute or two. So I, um, I am uh, the Senior Vice President for Customer Success at Instructure. You may or may not know me. How many people have been to an Instructure Con at some point? Okay, a couple of you. So you may have seen me at an Instructure Con in the past with a different role. I am in a new role, and I'll talk about that in just a second. Um, but as promised with the uh, guide for the conference and uh, the description with my presentation, I'm actually going to focus on something that's a bit near and dear to my heart today, which is revitalizing courses, especially for those of us that have taught for a long time online. It's like, how do you find the joy and the awesomeness back in your courses as you continue to revamp and improve over the years? But before I do that, I do have, let's see, I might have to, uh, hmm, I wonder what my thing is working. I might just have to do a little bit of lean. Um, I do have a couple of disclaimers for my presentation, uh, just up front. There's a lot of text. I'm not a great scripter, so I wanted to help close captioning with using a lot of text in the slides. So I'll warn you on that one. Um, Let's see if I can get this to work. Oh, now it's working. Perfect. Um, I also wanted to warn you that, like I said, we're going to have some chats in the conversation this morning. And uh, I'm going to ask you a couple personal questions. Not overly personal, I promise. I will share my own personal answers. But if you get personal, I just ask, like, perhaps we keep everything here with all of us um, so that nobody feels awkward about some of the conversations that we're going to have together. And then finally, you're welcome to use any and all of this. If you find it interesting, I will make sure you have my slides um, and any of the materials in here. But feel free to steal away. I would love to steal back. So if you use any of these activities, you find any of this useful, um, please let me know. And that's my Twitter handle, uh, because I'd love to be able to repurpose and reuse the materials here. OK, enough said with the disclaimers. <laughs> um, I want first, you all, and I think probably because you know each other already or you've got to know each other from yesterday's um, sessions, and you're probably sitting with people that you already do know, um, I'm going to ask you, though, to reintroduce yourself to somebody sitting with you. This is your warm up. And your question that you're going to talk about is what is your lame superpower? OK, so lame superpower, right? This, I'll give you my example. The pillows are a hint. I have the ability to fluff a perfect down pillow. This is something that when I travel, my husband is very mad at me. I get texts at night going, why aren't you here to fluff my pillow? Not a useful superpower in the world in general, but a helpful superpower or a lame superpower uh, on the side. So I ask that just to get to know each other at the table, because I am going to have you guys chat with some other questions, please share with one another your lame superpower. And I'll give you a couple minutes, and I'm timing you. OK, I hear good conversation. Two-minute warning. OK, so now that you guys know a little bit more about each other, I promise we'll have more time to chat about lame superpowers as we go on. Since you're so kind to share a little bit with one another and perhaps in a different spin, you now know that I can fluff pillows. Um, I have a few other interesting, somewhat lame superpowers like chopping strawberries really fast or doing some other very strange things. But I thought I'd, I'd step back and give you a little bit more insight into how I arrived at this place of wanting to revitalize my course. And I always find it interesting when you, uh, when you work with somebody in these kinds of settings, I consider myself a facilitator more than a speaker. Um, to get to know the person that you're, that you're working with because it helps sort of direct where these conversations are going. So I'll share a little bit, ooh, I'll share a little bit about myself. Um, so that is me at a very young age, proudly holding my first purse. I have a slight purse addiction. Um, you will probably also see this on the instructor website, which is a long story. They told me to put a funny picture up. I did, no one else did, but that's okay. Um, that's what happens. This is me graduating from college, so I was a political science major. Yes, that's at UCLA in Poly Pavilion with uh, 8,000 other people that graduated that same day. Um, it got a little bit smaller. I did some master's and graduate work in Columbia in New York. So my, my graduation day got a little bit smaller, but not much smaller. Um, that's when I graduated with my master's in, in educational policy. 
And then this is, this is when the, my heart um, for teaching, when I realized deep in my heart I wanted to teach and I wanted to be part of education. So I, I taught high school for a couple of years and did some extracurricular work around helping um, underprivileged kids prepare for the SAT. That teaching though generated into a love for technology, which then generated into, this is my very first graduate class that I taught. Um, actually these are half the students I taught online right out of the gate and this was at a conference we all gathered together and met. Um, and that's one of my very first classes that I taught. And interestingly enough, and probably a little bit scandalous, my husband is ooh, up in the left-hand corner. So that's, that's kind of how we met, but we'll leave the story at that. Uh, and then I have some very strange hobbies. I'm a ballroom dancer on the side, um, which is, like I said, a very strange hobby um, and a weird world. And yes, it's a lot like Dancing with the Stars. But that's a little bit about me and sort of how I ended up teaching and really caring about course revitalization. Um, so, so I found education very early on, and then I um, have, have grown in the ed tech space uh, over, the, over the duration of my career, and it's where I have arrived to, I, I want to make sure that as we're thinking about how we use technology, we have really good fundamental underlying principles for how we're teaching and how we find joy, just like I do in our teaching practice. So recently, like I said earlier today, I, I, um, I run our, our customer success organization. That's a new role for me. It's actually been in the last couple of months. So this is officially my first presentation with customers as a customer, uh, as a leader for instructor for customer success, which is really cool. I'm excited for that. Um, I'm also really proud that Instructure is a company that's chosen to have someone that's taught and implemented Canvas. Um, in their leadership team and running their customer success organization because it truly needs to be one that is customer centric. So this is just, in case you were curious, what we, what we do in my organization. We're a, a team of about 500, believe it or not, um, and we do all sorts of things from just daily support to making sure that you have all the resources that you need. But I just want to, in case people were curious what customer success was for Instructure, that's what it is. Now back to the revitalization though of teaching and how this, you know a little bit about my journey, how, how I've come to the place where I need actually a little bit of help and what, what tactics that I've used in order to refresh my own courses. Because throughout my career I've continued to teach, in fact I'm on my, I think when I, I did my chronology and I'll share my chronology with you, I think I'm on my 19th year teaching um, online in particular and that, ooh, and I lose an earring, well I'll lose the other one too. Um, and that makes a, a big difference in how I approach the courses that I build and how I facilitate those courses. So my journey, I, I, I showed you the picture of my first master's class. That was a, a class called Managing Technology for Change, and I taught that for a number of years. And my strategies with that course were very much about um, uh, iterations, right? It was like the small tweaks. It was the responding to technology. It was the, oh, there's this cool feature here. How can I leverage that? But it wasn't underlying curricular changes yet. And then I taught a new course, a leadership and technology course. And that I thought would be an underlying curricular change and I would rethink the just foundation of what I was teaching and how I was leveraging online tools. But instead it turned into mm, a little bit of the same, but just using a new LMS, which a lot of us do. So then I, I, I um, left where I was teaching and then uh, transitioned to a new institution, uh, UC Irvine actually, if anybody's curious. But I teach an e-learning a, a class and how to develop interactive e-learning for them. And I do it a couple times a year. And in that class, that's been where I've really paused and thought about how do I find sort of the, the depth in what I'm teaching? How do I actually get re-inspired? And then most importantly, how do I actually project what I'm trying to teach? And in this case, it's interactive e-learning. It really made me question how I should do that. So I went on this journey of, and in fact, I'm redoing my course right now. I'm rebuilding my course from scratch. And I went on this journey looking for ways to rethink this. I didn't want to just look at Canvas, and I teach in Canvas now, which I'm really excited about. But I didn't want to just look at Canvas and go, hmm, what kinds of tools can I use and have the technology lead my conversation? I mean, Canvas is really empowering, especially with its ecosystem, but I wanted more from it. Like, how do I, how do I find ways to connect with my students? How do I make my course 
create aha moments if I can. How do I, uh, how do I inspire perhaps through my course if possible, um, or at least allow students to find something within them that's meaningful. So trying to go down this journey, I, I, I walked through, I, you know, I, I went back to, to my old studies around instructional design, and I looked at tools, and I looked at a lot of best practices, and I realized part of my challenge is I love teaching. It's part of who I am, as, you, as you've seen. But I didn't have a way to connect that love. It was becoming formulaic, my teaching, or it was becoming I need to capture the best best practices and, and, take, a, and take a strategy and perfect it, not how do I actually bring into my teaching again who I am? So as I went through this journey, I found two tactics. And these are, these are tactics that worked, I think, well for us. I'm developing my course and that I wanted to pass on to you all as potential approaches to thinking about how to revitalize or refresh your courses online. So the first tactic um, that we'll talk about is a way to address a bigger challenge with students, right? Moving beyond just, I need my students to absorb my content, but instead shifting to, I'd like my students to understand the practice of learning. I'd like my students to understand and be inspired by what they can get out of, out of my course or courses or whatever their, their program or curriculum is within their institution. So it's, it's directing to something bigger. And if we want to do that bigger thing, like I said, we need to deep, dig deep into who we are as, our, as teachers. So the first approach I've taken is to take a look at what my strengths are. So this is, this is on, a, on, a, on a side journey as I'm learning uh, my own role at Instructure, because I'll be honest, I've never managed a customer success organization in my life. I'm a teacher, as you see, by trade, and, and an educational technologist and, a, and a, an academic technologist, not a customer success manager. Although I think very deeply that much of what we should be doing from a customer success experience, we should be doing in our teaching. And that's being very student-centric or very customer-centric if we think about that. And some of the foundational principles in customer success, as I'm, as I'm learning my own, my own new discipline, are to hone your strengths. And so the first tactic I want us to practice and work through is, together, is how do we find and hone our strengths? And I know this is going to sound really strange, but we often answer this question, right? This is where we go to in our teaching first, or in our practices first, or in our life first, right? It's about what am I not good at? What do I need to get better at? Right? And I can think of my own, if I were to answer this question, my own would be, I am a terrible assessment generator. Um, and I don't mean assignments in assessments. I mean um, tactical assessing of concrete knowledge that's not applied in applied kind of activities. I'm terrible at it. It's just not the way I think. So if, in most cases, when I've looked at revitalizing my course, I'm like, OK, I need to get better at how do I assess students? And how do I do that both um, formatively and summatively? And I need to do this, right? But instead, perhaps the question I should be asking myself is, what are my strengths in my teaching? What is it that I know I do well? Um, whether it's in a physical classroom or whether it's in an online space, what is it about my own practice that I do really well? And so I would like you all to take a few minutes to talk to one another about what those strengths are. And I ask for two reasons. One, because we're going to talk about how do we apply those in just a minute. But two, because I don't think we often recognize what's special about us and how we teach. We don't give ourselves that moment to acknowledge what we do really well and how we do that really well. And I think sharing that can oftentimes spark other opportunities for us to see what else we might do well. So somebody else might mention, I'm a good discussion facilitator. And you start to think about it, and you're like, oh yeah, I can do that really well too. And I never, I never really acknowledge that. So just take a couple minutes. I'll, I'll keep you timed. Um, at your table, share with a partner, share with the group. I see like threes and fours. What are you awesome at at your teaching? Or if you're instructional designers, what are you awesome at crafting in your teaching? So you've got a couple minutes. We'll take like three-ish minutes. Two-minute 
Okay, one more minute, wrap up. All right, I'm excited to see so much discussion happening. This is good. This is good acknowledgement of what we're all awesome at. So let's pull it back. Sorry to interrupt the great conversations that are happening. But if we pull it back, and as I mentioned before, um, in framing these conversations, as I'm going down my own journey of how do I revitalize my course, I'm also doing this journey around customer success. And how do we make sure that we are a very customer success driven organization? And in doing that, the reason I ask about strengths is because I've been um, digging into some theories behind the value of focusing on strengths. Now there's lots of different theories out there on should you focus more on strengths, should you focus more on weaknesses, but one of the most predominant ones that's applied across disciplines that you all might be familiar with is the Pareto Principle or the 80-20 rule, where you get 80% of your benefit out of 20% of your focused effort. So if you think about that, and this is actually true in the customer success world, so for those of you, I'm learning like I said, so for those of you unfamiliar with customer success, um, but have may heard a, a few phrases, there's a, a tool called NPS, or Net Promoter Score. Net Promoter Scores are often utilized with products, all kinds of products. We actually use it with Canvas, but all sorts of products can use that Net Promoter Score in order to identify how aligned is someone with your product or service or offering or whatever it might be. And within Net Promoter Scores, generally the, the, the recommendations are to focus on the top 20, the favorable 20%. So the people that are very much interested, aligned to, and, um, and would clearly recommend your product, service, or whatever it might be. And the research that's been done behind that theory aligns to the 80-20 principle, where that's where you have the opportunity to do the most with your effort. Well, you don't want to ignore the rest. But that's where less of your energy and less of your effort should be applied. And so like I said, this 80-20 rule has been applied in lots of different industries. And I've seen it. I've actually seen um, faculty development teams and instructors use the same theory. So if you think about it, and you think about what you're awesome at, how do you leverage that as much as possible as you design your courses? So in my case, I like to facilitate online conversations. And I like to try to create connections with students. And students will often, if I look at my course evaluations, walk away from my course and acknowledge that. Deliberately call that out. By the way, that's another good way to figure out what you're good at is see where the positive comments are always, always coming from in your evaluations. Um, but so students will acknowledge that. Now where students will challenge me often is, um, ooh, I'd like more in-depth potentially readings, or I would like better, uh, uh, I'd like quizzes. I can't believe students actually ask me for quizzes, but they ask me for quizzes to test their knowledge as we go through the courses. So, so knowing that balance helps me though know where to spend that 80% of my time. And so as I'm revitalizing my course now, as I've done in iterations um, more recently, I focus a lot on the way the dialogue is constructed in my class and how students interact with one another. That does generate a lot more work for me on one end because a lot of that is about me really getting in there and facilitating conversations. But on the other side, there are things that I could normally put effort into that I'm not in order to get the best benefit out of my course. Now I do happen to have topics that apply really nicely to that. There are other topics that don't, that you sort of have to do certain things in order to make sure that students are, especially online, that students are, are, are building the skills you need them to build. But the 80-20 principle is a good way to think about potentially how you focus where you put your energy and how you design your courses. Similarly, positive psychology talks about how strengths and focusing on your strengths also drive happiness and that happiness can be seen through your work. And there's lots of research actually that's been done where companies are way more effective or um, services are way more effective or could be teaching is way more effective when there's joy and happiness exuding from the folks that are leading those conversations. And I can tell a lot of you do that already just given the conversations at 9 a.m. in the morning on Friday um, before a weekend uh, and after a long day of conferencing yesterday. But, but bringing that out, so if, if focusing on our strengths can help um, not only uh, generate the kinds of outcomes we have, because that's where we can put our energy, but it can also help us find joy in the work that we're doing, that can also have an impact. And I know this feels like a, oh yeah, of course, moment, 
But, but like I said before, how often do we take a moment to actually acknowledge that and think about that and think about how that actually applies to course design or how you're facilitating your courses? So for example, if you think about what that strength is that you just share with your, with your peers and your colleagues, if you think about that, think about tactically what does that translate into? What is that skill that you have? And then that skill can become something that you, that you hone and repeat and you focus on. So these are just a couple of examples. If you're really great, like the first example at generating meaningful discussions, this probably means you're good at, at either creating prompts or you're good at facilitating online classes or, or office hours or um, uh, virtual sessions. If you're good at uh, providing feedback, this probably means that you can craft rubrics really well. Uh, it should, at least, even if those rubrics are in your head. Um, or it should mean that you know how to encourage students to uh, help one another and create peer activities and peer reflection moments. So thinking about what those skills are and then translating, or what those awesome moments are, and then translating those into your tactics, you can then go make sure that your course is full of opportunities for those moments and not as much full of the opportunities of the things that you personally struggle with or that don't bring you joy. So that was my first tactic that I've been applying as I've been learning, like I said, about my own customer success journey and then revitalizing my course. The second tactic that I've been applying is the power of moments. And has anybody read that book, The Power of Moments? Awesome, awesome, okay. So we've got a couple people, that's great. So this book also was introduced to me as I'm looking at how can we create a really incredible customer experience. I think we've done a lot as a company. I think there's a lot more that we can do. And one of the books that was recommended to me is to take a look at this book called The Power of Moments. Now, The Power of Moments um, focuses on things in your life that are memorable. Okay, and that's where it starts. And then I'll talk to you about there's four kinds of moments in your life, and then we'll talk a little bit about how we can apply those. But before we do those, if you just take a second to think to yourself about a moment in your life that had an impact on you. What was that moment, okay? So what was that moment? What happened before it and after it? Can you remember that? And what was that impact that it had on you? So think about any moment in your life. Let's just take a minute, just think personally about that. We'll share in a few seconds, but think about a moment in your life. Everybody have a moment? No? Okay. As you're thinking about that moment, now think a moment similarly in your teaching. What's a moment that had an impact? That doesn't mean positive, it could be a negative impact, I hate to say that, but it could be a negative. But what's a, a moment in your teaching or your design career that had an impact on you? What happened before and after it, and what was the impact? Okay, I see thinking. Okay, and then last, think about a moment that as a student or a learner, so it could even be the last time you tried to put together IKEA furniture. That's a learning moment, that's for sure. Uh, think about a moment as a learner that had an impact on you. What happened before, what happened after, and what was the impact? So while you're thinking of those, I'm going to have you, oops, sorry, I skipped one too many. Um, I'd love you to share those with your table. So just take a minute and pick one of those. It could be the teaching moment, it could be the learner moment, or it could be the personal moment. But share with each other at the table what that moment was, what happened before and after, and what was the impact that moment had on you. So just take a couple minutes. Okay, we have one more minute. Wrap up your conversations. I promise there'll be lots of time at lunch. Okay, so in the power of moments, as you guys come back from your conversations, they talk about four distinct kind of moments. And I'm guessing that your conversations probably covered one of these distinct moments. So the fundamental principle is that we remember okay, the moments, good or bad, in our lives. 
but we don't remember a lot of the in-between. So probably for some of you, what happened before and after was probably hard to remember, right? You just remember the moment, and maybe a couple of details right before or right after. Common ones are moments on vacations that people talk about personally, like I remember seeing something, or this moment with my family sitting you know, at this table and the joy that we all had together. But a lot of times, like I said, the details before and after blur. Well, so the, if the underlying principle is that there are these moments in our lives we remember, for good or for bad, but not a lot of the in-between, how do we think about crafting or facilitating or fostering those moments, and what, what, how, how do those moments take shape? So generally, moments are of four types, um, and you'll see here, there's elevation, insight, pride, and connection. So moments of elevation. Those are moments where the script is broken. That's the exact, the best way to describe it. It's the moment, the high, the whoa, that's not what I expected. Um, the uh, I, I assumed something would be a certain way, and wow, it just really isn't that way. And generally, these are good moments, although they can be, they can be bad moments as well. But that's a moment of elevation. When we talk in a minute about how to apply these in courses, this can be one of the hardest because they're very different for people. How you, how you react to things are entirely based on your own expectations. So understanding where you might break that script or uh, provide the unexpected can be challenging because it can be different for different people. But there are ways that we can do that. Now one that's a little more easy are moments of insight. So with moments of insight, this is where you have a aha moment, right? This is the, oh, now I get it moment. <laughs> or if you think about it, this is the, um, wow, I just learned something about myself. So, you know, I can think of things, my first job uh, after I did my graduate business work, I worked for a pharmaceutical company and it was a really lovely company, the people were great. I had no interest in pharmaceuticals. Like, it, there was a moment probably nine months into that job where I went, whoa, I'm an educator. This, this is not my thing. And I, I can remember that moment. I can't tell you what happened before or after, but it was that moment of insight or you learn something about yourself. Now the third kind of moment is a moment of pride. This is where you've done something that you didn't think you could accomplish or that um, not only do you personally recognize, but you're recognized by others in a way that's meaningful to you. So this is a I accomplished it moment, or a um, I got through that moment, <laughs> like I survived that moment. Um, and so it's, it can be a, uh, a very personal moment, but it can also be a social moment, which is related to the moments of, oops, one more click. Sorry, nope, now I get stuck. Well, okay. Last slide is moments of connection, and for some reason my laptop decided to freeze. So moments of connection are those social moments. They're when you are connecting with one another, and that social connection, it, 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 you become part of a tribe, or you feel like there are other people around you that connect with you and that that's meaningful. So if we think about those four types of connections, and we think about, once again, translating that into our classes. So how do we take those four connections and have them connect into what we're crafting in our courses? So as I mentioned before, um, if you think about moment of elevation, and when I share the slides, you'll see I have examples of each of these for you. Um, but when you share moments, of, when you try to craft as an instructor moments of elevation. So those are those moments of where you're breaking the script. So some ways that you can think about doing that, things that I've seen instructors do, is with guest speakers, as an example. Bring in somebody that is in the discipline that talks about how they weren't originally in that discipline, or they never understood that discipline in that way, or they hadn't um, spent their life preparing for the job that your students want. That in fact, this is how they got there, and it's through hard work or whatever it might have been. That's a script break, because your students might think, oh no, it's going to take me X, Y, and Z to get to this job. Okay, now this person who's really successful is coming in and telling me that it's actually these things, and that can be a moment of breaking the script. You can use guest speakers to do that. You can use a lot of different ways to do that. It also, it's also can be a moment of how do you rethink, how do you help your students destroy those expectations they have? So I've actually created moments of elevation in my course around 
how I do a, a project. So I have my students do a capstone project and, and they build throughout, throughout the course. And I push, 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 and then right about the end of the course, um, you know, when my students are working the hardest and they're like, yeah, but I have to do these five deliverables, I'll tell them, actually you don't. What I've seen all of your energy up until now, I want you to pick one of those and focus really hard. Now I've broken the script, it's unexpected for them, and typically what happens is the student will focus on something really, really well, and then they will also finish the rest of the project really well. It's the, it's the breaking of the script so they can have the moment in that learning to really understand and apply that learning. Similar with moments of insight, um, there's lots of things you can do to have people have, to have students have aha moments. Some of that, I, I, still, I still think about uh, some courses that uh, my friends took in, in undergraduate that were biology majors. And the moment in the OCHEM class where they realized I am not made out for OCHEM, right? But those are purposeful moments that help students, although maybe in that case not succeed in that course, but it does help students have a moment of, is this really what I want to do or not do? Similarly with moments of pride. Students un un can uncover, depending on how you craft your tasks in your class, how you structure your conversations and discussions, students can uncover moments of, wow, I did that. That's really cool. And you can create celebratory moments with other students. So things, and I, I imagine many of you do these, with group projects or with major projects, having lots of sharing moments, but then having a way to um, have a share at the end of that project where students can acknowledge great things about other students' projects or talk about what they struggled and how they overcome those struggles in those projects. And then last, the moment of connection. That one can be really powerful. Um, if you think about how do you bring students that may have similar values or interests together around projects. So creating real world projects, aligning those real world projects, um, and, and, and finding ways to either role play or create scenarios that really hone into students certain interests. And once again, this is a great place for group projects. This is a great place for leveraging other capacities within Canvas or within whatever you may be using to find, to have students find each other that they might not normally have been able to find each other um, in the same way in a physical environment. So, so different ways that you can leverage and create these moments. Now one word of caution with moments, um, as I've been experimenting with these uh, and, and thinking about how to rebuild my course and then having folks evaluate my course and tell me where I can do better with my, my new course, um, is that they aren't all going to be the same for every student. So well, so it's not like you can say, okay, here's my course map, I'm gonna have a moment here and a moment here and a moment here and everybody's gonna have those moments. It's more about creating lots of little opportunities for moments that different types of students will then last, latch on to. And I think if a student can even just have one moment in your course, even if it's a small moment, but it's one that they go to a conference five years from now and they sit and they think about the moments in their life when they're prompted, that they'll remember that, um, even, if it's, even if it's just about that experience that they had, right? It goes back to the bigger dream we all want our students to have skills and to develop those skills coming out of our courses, but we also want them to understand and reflect on themselves and how they are lifelong learners and how they can accomplish what they want to. So even if that little moment leads to that, that can be super powerful. So those have been the two principles that I've tried to apply or two tactics that I've tried to apply as I've revitalized my courses. And I'm, and I'm hopeful that some of these conversations that you've had here today with one another can help sort of spark some ideas of, okay, let me go back to my course and what could I change or how could I emphasize either some of my strengths in my teaching and how I leverage those or how I create moments in my teaching as well. Um, I also, you'll, you'll, hopefully you'll see, and, and um, I, I open all of you, my last slide is my contact information, both my email, it's melissa at instructure.com, um, and my Twitter handle, and I would love to hear from all of you around any of this, and if any of this is having an impact, but I would also love to hear from all of you around this and how this relates to how we support you as an organization because I'm trying very hard for us to take these two tactics from a customer success perspective and apply them as well. How do we focus on our strengths and how do we make sure we bring more of that to you and understand what those strengths are and how do we create moments for you so that you can continue to do what you need to do in a really impactful way, which is change students' lives. 
So I thank you for your time. I will be here if you have questions. I'm happy to chat of any of this. Um, I also am around, I wanted to make sure, I thought we'd have a little extra time, and then I realized this was only 45 minutes. I was gonna do an Ask Me Anything if you wanted to ask just Canvas-related questions. So I'll hang out somewhere over here, and if you have any Canvas-related questions that I can try to answer, I'd be happy to do that as well. And I know Eddie and, and Jesse are here as well to do that. But thank you all for your time this morning. I hope you have a great uh, rest of your conference and rest of the weekend.